Vampires in this world are the kind who cannot at all go out into the sun or they will die. That was the vampires coming to get me. Hi, I'm Mark and I'm taking a break from my usual bathtub barbecue videos to instead talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So at the start of my videos I do tend to have that like, oh taking a break from my usual type of video that I don't actually make to do whatever the topic is, but this time it is actually quite a different topic for me. Most of the videos that I've done on this channel have been in some way about books, but with my last video I talked a little bit about music as well and I do have other interests, so I wanted to I don't know, make something a bit different here. As to the content of this video, the title says it all, I have never watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer before and I decided in the year of our Lord 2022 to begin. For context, I have heard a lot of great things about Buffy over the years and every time that I heard it I would kind of go, really? Buffy the Vampire Slayer? I remember seeing it on TV a lot when I was a kid and I never watched it. I probably wouldn't have been too interested in it when I was a kid, especially because I really hated horror stuff. I was and still kind of am a bit of a scaredy cat. But other than that, I think I just kind of judged it off nothing. I'm not really sure why I judged it negatively, but I always just thought it doesn't sound like peak TV, as if I know what peak TV is, and as if everything needs to be peak TV. So I guess after enough times of me hearing about it, it finally stuck that like, hey, maybe I should give this a try. So first of all, sorry to everybody who I didn't take seriously when they recommended Buffy before to me, because even though I don't think I've ever dismissed the recommendation, I definitely took it on as, oh, that's cool that you like it, I'm never going to watch it. But... That statement is now false, because I have watched it, the first season at least. I was also looking for something that's a bit more light than what I'd normally watch, because I feel like one thing that I get hung up on a bit when I watch TV or movies is being 100% totally captivated the entire time. Maybe captivated isn't the right word, but like paying full attention. Say earlier this year I watched House of the Dragon, and that is a show that I really felt like I needed to be watching everything, listening to every word, analyzing things as I went, or at least intaking all of the information that was given to me. But I wanted a show that I could just put on, not even necessarily in the background, but just put on an also maybe do something else if I wanted to. I can put on an episode while I'm like getting ready for bed, while I'm organizing my magic cards, you know, things like that that make it less high commitment or at least the feeling that I don't need to be watching every single second. And a funny thing is that I did originally decide to do this and think, yeah, this will be nice, easy, light watching, but some of it then really compels me to be very involved and watching it a lot. But it does have some episodes where I can just take a bit more of a backseat and I've been enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. I'm guessing that this video will end up being like part season overview and part thoughts on the show. I, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to come together. This is, as I said, a bit new territory for me, but I'm definitely going to go over each episode and talk a little bit about them as well. And just to make it clear, I will be going through every episode and all the plots of those episodes, so I will be spoiling things about the show if you haven't watched it. I'm not saying that you can't watch this if you haven't watched the show. I've watched people explain things like H2O Just Add Water, even though I've never watched an episode of it. But if you do want to watch it yourself, this is not a video you should watch before watching any of the show. Un unless you want it spoiled beforehand. I, I don't know what your preferences are in watching TV shows, it's not how I would do it, but that's a warning for you. Do with it what you want. I will also point out my outfit. I was going to dress up a, at least a little bit closer to Angel for this, I had the thought. I realized it probably wouldn't come across that much because it would just be me in a shirt and a suit jacket and I don't own any leather jackets which he seems to wear a lot of. So instead I decided to dress up as a character whose fashion sense tends to line up a lot more with my wardrobe, Willow Rosenberg, my absolute queen. Actually my queen is Cordelia, we'll get to that later, but I love Willow, I loved her from the first episode and she's the character who most often I will see her wearing something and go like, I would wear that. It's a lot of like nice jumpers and overalls as the Americans would call it. I would call these dungarees. I am also wearing, can you see? Yeah, some like white runners with red, which I think in one episode, oh, my knee cracked. I, I think in one episode she did wear like Adidas like, white runners with 
red on them which i don't own adidas ones i own nike ones so these will have to be close enough but yes this is my light cosplay for this hopefully you enjoy in case you also don't know what buffy is um welcome i guess thanks for being here i'm not sure why you're here but if it's for me thank you thank you very much but buffy the vampire slayer is a 1997 television show that ran for seven seasons it was created by joss whedon who's also famous for things like firefly dr horrible sing along blog the avengers uh, being a, a bad person and let me talk about that for a second i'm not going to use this video to go into anything about joss whedon and how he's not a great guy one of the main reasons that i decided to start watching buffy was seeing how much one of my favorite YouTubers and video essays, Sarah Z loves the show. I normally say Z when I use that letter, but for Sarah, I'll say Sarah Z. Seeing how much Sarah loves the show and other people who I know made me actually go and watch it. And I know that Sarah Z has talked a little bit more about Joss Whedon as a person specifically in an old video about Dr. Horrible's sing along blog, which is something that I also watched as a teenager and really enjoyed. And so to have something that goes a little bit more into that issue, I'm going to link that video in the description and also in a card as well. It's by no means a comprehensive look into Joss Joss Whedon and his actions as a person, but it says a lot more than I would have any authority to talk about in this video or in general. And it's also a video from a creator who I love, who also loves Buffy. And so this is just going to be more me talking about the first season of Buffy and how I enjoyed it, because I did, did enjoy it, at least in parts. And in case you haven't watched the show before or it's been a while, I'm going to give you a quick crash course on some of the mechanics of this world. So first of all, the Slayer is a title or a role held by one girl at a time who is chosen to fight vampires and demons and the forces of darkness. She is gifted with superhuman abilities and senses to help her with this and I have no idea how they're chosen. I either miss that in the lore or they don't explain it. I, I, I guess it just happens. Someone becomes comes the vampire slayer. Vampires in this world are the kind who cannot go out in the sun or they will die. And as far as I can tell, they live immortally unless they're killed. They also need to be invited into a home at least once in order to enter it. They are afraid of crosses and will be burned by them if they touch them. And like the sun, they will die if pierced by a stake. I'm not 100% sure if the stake has to actually be through their heart. I feel like one of the episodes I saw one die with a stake through like the center of their chest but I mean it could have just been a mistake in editing and they didn't have a better take I I don't know vampires of course also have to drink blood in this show to survive I think specifically it has to be human blood like even the spoilers there is a good vampire in the show even the good vampire in the show drinks human blood he just gets it from like a blood bank or or the hospital instead of like the blood juice box that is our human flesh bodies don't know how I feel about that line and here's another very specific definition that I've never heard from any other vampire media. When someone becomes a vampire, they lose their soul, which basically guarantees them to become evil because they gain the desire to drink human blood and they lose their ability to feel remorse. Also, instead of just getting long teeth to reveal themselves as vampires, vampires in this show have like a human form where they look normal and then like a fucked up face vampire form, which they switch between often. Finally, I don't think they can transform into like bats or wolves or mist like some other vampires, but I am just basing that off of what I know from the first season. Okay, so that's, I think, all the preamble I need. Let's start talking about episodes one and two. Welcome to the Hellmouth and the Harvest. I'm doing these two episodes together because they basically make up one two-part premiere. The show opens with a guy and a girl sneaking into the guy's high school and the girl seeming very worried until he assures her that they're definitely alone, at which point she looks relieved, then turns into a vampire and bites him. I love a concise opening and I do think that this really sets the precedent for leaving your expectations at the door with this show. We then meet Buffy Summers, a vampire slayer who moves to Sunnydale, California after being kicked out of her old school in LA for burning down the gym. Buffy is being driven to her new school by her mother Joyce, where we then meet some of the supporting cast. Cordelia is the popular mean girl, Willow's a computer nerd, and Xander, whatever his deal is, he's just a guy who's there, he doesn't really have a, a thing. Apparently he fits into this archetype that I found on TV tropes called tough crowd where he makes all these jokes and nobody laughs at them. 
because he's not funny. Okay, maybe that's a bit mean, but we'll get to Xander. Oh, and he's attracted to Buffy. Actually, that's that's kind of his whole deal this season. We also meet the school's principal, Principal Flutie, and its new librarian, Rupert Giles, who has a book called <gasps> Wampir. It turns out that the body of the guy from the start of the episode was left in a locker, and so now Jim's cancelled instead of like the entire school closing down because there was a dead student found in a locker. But anyway, Buffy goes to check out the body and finds signs of a vampire attack. She goes back to Giles and his book, who it turns out is a watcher, someone who helps watch over and train the Slayer. Buffy says that she doesn't need a watcher because she's just going to be a regular teenager. No more vampires for her. And that's where the show ends. No, but really. After that she leaves, but Xander has overheard the Slayer talk. On her way to the Bronze, which is a club that 16 year olds can go to for some reason, Buffy meets, a, oh my good god, an absolute babe named Angel, who warns her of an impending event called the Harvest. I'd, I'd let him harvest me. That one doesn't really work. We don't actually know his name at this point, but it's easier to talk about him with his name. Angel also gives her a cross necklace, which is pretty cute, I guess. Aw, I wonder if there's going to be a little romance here, huh? I hope he's also 16, and not, like, way older than her. In the bronze, Giles tells Buffy that- wait, why is Giles here? <laughs> I kind of forgot about that scene. Giles is just there- watching the children. I guess he's a watcher. I guess that's what he does. Anyway, he tells her that she should be able to sense vampires, but she instead uses her fashion sense to identify one who is talking to Willow. Oh, please. Look at his jacket. He's got the sleeves rolled up and the shirt. Deal with that outfit for a moment. It's dated. It's carbon -dated. Buffy loses sight of them when the vampire ends up leading Willow to a crypt in the graveyard, along with another vampire named Darla, who leads another high schooler named Jesse there too. We see a glimpse of an extra powerful vampire named the Master beneath Sunnydale, who is woken from his long slumber to prepare for the harvest. Buffy and Xander appear at the crypt, then Willow, Jesse and Xander flee. Buffy kills one of the vampires, and then a third extra strong vampire named Luke, his name's just Luke, throws her into a stone coffin and is about to kill her when to be continued. Episode 2. Buffy uses her silver cross from Angel to repel Luke and escape, then saves Willow and Xander from vampires. But oh no, Jesse has been taken. Not Jesse. So Buffy, Willow, Xander, and Giles. Hey, that's a pretty cool group. I hope we see more of those four together in the future. These four regroup, and after all the supernatural stuff is explained to the two confused party members, Buffy goes searching in the sewer for vampires while Giles and Willow research. Angel. Oh my god, Angel. Angel appears just before Buffy enters the vampire's tunnels through the crypt and tells her how to get to the master's lair. Good luck. Xander also catches up to Buffy even though she told him not to come. When they find Jesse it turns out he's a vampire now and the two of them narrowly escape into the daytime. Underground the master turns the vampire Luke into something called the vessel while back in the library. Hey this place would make a cool base of operations. I hope we see more of it. We learn that Sunnydale is built on a portal to demon land known as the Hellmouth and the master wants to open it. Also tonight is the night of the harvest which it turns out is going to be like a mass feeding event to give the master her strength and it's going to happen at the bronze but Buffy shows up saves Cordelia and fights all of the vampires before they can kill anyone to save the day or night it's actually nighttime. We also get a moment of Xander kind of accidentally staking his former friend Jesse and Giles being attacked by Darla until Willow the absolute queen throws holy water on her I love you Willow I would die for you please give me your wardrobe the next day, nobody who was at the bronze the night before realises that there was anything supernatural going on, which is just the first of many examples of the people of Sunnydale being totally oblivious to vampires and demons and evil supernatural stuff that happens in their town all the time. Buffy tells Xander and Willow that they're in for more of these nights because there are more monsters to fight. Giles questions whether a group of teenagers are equipped for this, which is honestly so fair and I think the only time that this is really addressed in the first season. But anyway, that's it. That's the end. As I was watching the season, I made stream of consciousness notes, most of which ended up getting integrated into the script, but I thought that some of these notes from episode one were just kind of fun. I'm three quarters of the way through the first episode and so far, I like Buffy. 
she's spunky. Willow is already my favourite character. Still could very much be true. I love her fashion style. She gives me big Pisces energy, which I just identify with Willow a lot. She's very soft, but she, like, she's very, I feel like she's very sure of who she is, even though it's not always, like, it doesn't always come through an outward confidence. I think Willow knows who she is in a way. Maybe I'm projecting a bit too much in what I hope to be. But she gives me big soft Pisces energy. And as I said, I share most of my wardrobe with her than anyone else in the show. I'm mostly neutral towards Xander. He hasn't done much, but I'm not sure I like him. I don't know. Honestly, could still be said now, even though I've watched all of the first season and most of the second season at this stage. That guy who I think is Angel is really gorgeous. Wow. That is a direct verbatim note that I had about the guy who turned out to be Angel. I also said, so far it feels Joss Whedon-y, but not like too Joss Whedon-y. I don't think that the, the like one-liners and stuff are that bad in the first two episodes, but maybe I went in expecting a lot of Joss Whedon and it was a normal amount. I'm not really sure, but that was one of my notes. And the last note was also, what the fuck is up with these 16 year olds at this club? True. Episode three, which it's time for Buffy to try out for cheerleading here in Sunnydale High and it looks, wait a minute, that girl is auditioning so hard she's catching fire, what the fuck, it's Katniss Everdeen, but it's okay, Buffy saves her. I do have to say that the intro to this episode really caught me off guard because there was cheerleading and then suddenly there was just a girl on fire. <laughs> then, during a class of driver's ed, Cordelia suddenly loses the ability to see and is also saved by Buffy. Giles says that this could be the work of a witch and also I made a note here that he he is, and I quote, horny for living on a hellmouth. Buffy and the gang become suspicious of Amy, a girl who didn't make the squad but whose mother is a former star cheerleader. They steal some of her hair and confirm that she's been casting spells through science? Magic? I don't, I don't know. They, they know that she's been casting spells. However, later at Amy's house, we also see that she has stolen a bracelet from Buffy, and after telling her own mother to do homework, let's put a pin in that, she takes the bracelet upstairs. The next morning, Buffy is acting erratically because a spell was cast on her which will kill her in three hours if it isn't reversed. Buffy and Giles then have to go to Amy's house to get the spell book for the reversal. When they confront Amy's mom, Catherine, there, they realize that this is actually Amy in Catherine's body after Catherine, the real witch swapped their bodies so she could relive the glory of being a cheerleader when she was a teenager. They take the book back to the school where Giles attempts to reverse the spell while Catherine, in Amy's body, tries to stop them. The spell is eventually reversed and then Buffy fights Catherine, now back in her own body, and defeats Catherine by reflecting a spell that she cast back at her. Amy and Buffy then become friends, uh, even though she doesn't appear again in this season. Also at the end, the two of them wonder while looking at cheerleading trophies what the spell that Amy's mom cast would have done to Buffy, and then when they walk away, it cuts to Amy's mom trapped inside one of the trophy toppers. Like, I know that this show is about, like, ghosts and ghouls and vampires, but I still found that moment, like, surprisingly fucked up. Episode 4, Teacher's Pet. This episode opens with Buffy having a very sweet and encouraging conversation with her biology teacher before, whoops, he gets murdered by what I thought was a giant plant. Spoilers, it's not. Angel, oh my god, Angel. Angel shows up again to warn Buffy very cryptically that something is coming. What's this guy's deal, anyway? Miss Natalie French is the substitute biology teacher while Dr. Gregory is missing. Missing his head, am I right? Oh wait, shit, no, that's later. Ne never mind, go back to the episode. And of course, all the boys in the class are obsessed with her. Miss French suggests making model egg sacks for the science fair that's coming up and chooses some guy named Blaine and also Xander to help her. Ugh, the classic, how many times have I heard, uh, come help me with my egg sack project. <laughs> Oldest trick in the book. I do want to talk about Xander for a second because at this stage in the show he's just kind of giving horny, sexist, but not as bad as the other boys high school boy energy and I don't really care for him honestly. I do hope that this is like set up for a good character arc down the line where he can become a better person and learn that he can also contribute to the group but it doesn't happen this season so we'll see. Cordelia, th this poor girl, finds the missing Dr. Gregory's corpse in the cafeteria. Missing his head, am I right? <laughs> Cut it, publish it, we're done. 
I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm I'm the one who cuts the videos and publishes them. And I have more video to record. Actually, to have another character aside, I'm also hoping that Cordelia gets a bit more development because at the moment she's just showing up a fair bit, but she's just kind of a superficial bully character. Buffy confronts a vampire in the park about a homeless man who also died, trying to see if it's connected to Dr. Gregory. The vampire runs away into Miss French, who he's seemingly scared of, and then the next day Buffy witnesses Miss French turn her head around 180 degrees. Yeah, I think there's something up with her. Buffy and Giles deduce that Miss French is a giant, praying mantis, which is an actual sentence that was in the Wikipedia article for this episode. <laughs> Giles also calls some old colleague who apparently went mad trying to prove the existence of this creature, which he calls the She-Mantis, or Virgin Thief. Meanwhile, Xander goes to Miss French's house after school to help her with her egg sac project. If you know what I mean. She pours him a martini and puts him in a cage with Blaine. If you know what I mean. No, I'm kidding. I, the show is not gay. Not yet, anyway. Fingers crossed who it seems was also easily captured as a result of being horny. Buffy, Giles and Willow find the vampire from earlier and basically use him as a giant praying mantis detector to find out where she lives. Right before she's about to <coughs> mate with Xander, Buffy crashes the party and defeats the giant mantis by hacking her to bits with, with a machete. It's actually pretty fucking metal. We then get a little stinger at the end with hatching giant praying mantis eggs in Dr. Gregory's closet, and I have no idea if this ever comes up again in later seasons, but I hope so. Episode 5. The name of this episode is Never Kill a Boy on the First Date, which I think is my second least favourite episode title of this season. Even though I only recently realised that it's a pun on like never kiss a boy on the first date, and yet it that doesn't make me think it's any better at all. I still think it's a bad title. We start with Buffy fighting a vampire while Giles gives emotional support. Kick him in the dick, Buffy! I can't do Giles' voice. When she stakes him, the vampire disappears into dust as always, including his clothes, which, to be honest, I don't know why that happens in this show, but whatever. But Buffy notices a ring in the grass that is unaffected by the staking, like it's a magical item from D&D &D or something. Giles finds out that this ring is linked to a prophecy about someone called the Anointed One who is tied to freeing the master from his prison. Buffy arranges a date with a soft boy named Owen, but Giles thinks that the Anointed One prophecy is going to be fulfilled that night, so instead she ditches the date and goes to the graveyard. The dark forces are aligning against us and we have a chance to beat them back. Tonight we go into battle. Perhaps I miscalculated. I'm thinking yes. Somewhere else we see a bus crash that kills five people, which the next day Giles connects with this prophecy. But after skipping one last night, Buffy chooses to instead go on a date with Owen over her slaying. But not her slaying, am I right? Look at that outfit. She's killing it. Also vampires. I want to note here that the most unrealistic part to me of this vampire based show so far is that there's a club where 16 year olds can go and nobody there is super messy and drunk. Like I don't care if they don't sell alcohol, if this was in Ireland people would be sneaking naggins in, strapped to their thigh and they would be necking them in the bathroom. Anyway. With Buffy unavailable, Giles goes to the funeral home with the bodies of the bus crash victims, and there are vampires there, of course there are vampires there. Thankfully Xander and Willow had followed Giles, so they now know he's in trouble and they go and get help. Angel, oh, Angel. Angel, Willow and Xander all warn Buffy about the prophecy, and Owen ends up along for the ride as they all go to help Giles in the funeral home. Actually, not Angel, he's still in his just giving cryptic messages era, not his like actually helping out era. Buffy does find Giles in the funeral home, but the other three find a bus crash victim who is now resurrected as a vampire who they think is the anointed one. Notice how I said think. Owen gets bonked on the noggin by the not so anointed one who claims that Owen is now dead. Buffy, angry that the vampire killed her date, burns him in a furnace which is pretty fucking metal honestly. But Owen's okay because it, it was just a bonk to be fair. The next day, Owen says that he'd like to see Buffy again, but he's only really interested in the thrill-seeking side of her, and she refuses, worrying about his safety. Giles tries to reassure Buffy by telling her he also had to choose the life he was raised for over the one that he wanted, and they both take comfort knowing that they killed the Anointed One. 
Eh, uh, psych. The Anointed One was a kid the whole time. Episode 6, The Pack. Sunnydale students are at the zoo, and there's a nerd being harassed by some bullies. All is right in the animal kingdom. When the nerd refuses to rat out the bullies to the principal, they decide to quote-unquote reward him by bringing him with them to the sealed-off hyena enclosure. Xander follows too, but Willow and Buffy are stopped by the zookeeper. In the hyena house, we see the hyena's eyes flash, and then all the bullies' eyes flash, as well as Xander's, and they all start laughing. Xander starts acting like a dickhead, or at least more of a dickhead. Maybe that's a bit unfair. Like, has he been a dickhead up to this point? Maybe he's just more kind of been a bit of a shit, but he's a dickhead now, basically. The bullies are also affected, and we see all of them gang up on the nerd from earlier during a game of dodgeball. A piglet mascot, who's here now, is scared by Xander, which tips Buffy off to something being wrong. And later, Xander and the bullies eat the pig. The poor little pig. It's, uh, it's kind of fucked, and... Also, on that note, Hyena Xander attacks Buffy and seems like he's intending to assault her, and it made me quite uncomfortable to watch. I know that Xander's actions in this episode were explained by him being possessed, but I still didn't like seeing his character act that way, and I do think that him and the characters could have had a bit more of a reaction to some of his very, very bad, bad, not good actions while he was possessed. Anyway, Buffy... Buffy? Buffy knocks Xander out and locks him in book prison in the library. Free them! Meanwhile, the bullies are brought to the principal's office for punishment after killing the school mascot, and, um... So this is kind of the pinnacle for me of feeling weird about this episode. It's been on a steady incline, but uh, this is where it hits the top. Like... I think it's on the goofier side of plot points so far. I mean, they're possessed by a magical hyena, for fuck's sake. But at this point in the episode, the bullies murder Principal Flutie by eating him. These kids commit straight-up fucking cannibalism on this man, this innocent character who we've seen in every episode so far. And he's played by that guy. You know, that guy. He's in stuff. It's jarring, honestly, and I really didn't think that it fit well tonally. Maybe I'm being a bit sensitive about this, but I did not enjoy this aspect or a lot of other aspects of this episode. So then Buffy and Giles go to talk to the zookeeper, who apparently knows about the magic, and they devise a plan to help Xander and the others. Buffy lures all the hyena students to the zoo. She must do a lot of cardio to be able to run that much. But plot twist, the zookeeper wants the powers for himself. The zookeeper successfully takes the spirit for himself, but Buffy and Xander, who's now free, force him into the enclosure where the hyenas eat him. Also pretty gruesome. Then at the end we have a certified bro moment between our two main dudes where Giles promises to take Xander's secrets of how he acted while possessed to the grave. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. But like, Xander, my guy, maybe I'm just a bit too much of an emotional Pisces, but like, I would have been way more upset if I had found out that I lost control of my body and did the things that Xander did. Okay. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> that episode is done. That's also the end of the first half of the season, and we're about to start the second half with a very pivotal episode that I really enjoyed. Episode 7, Angel. Uh, weirdly enough, despite really enjoying this episode, I actually only took one note, but I think it's because I was so engrossed in the story, and I was also eating a very delicious Indian takeaway. I also did a bit of research before I started watching the show. One thing that came up from that is that I learned I should only watch the original TV versions of the show, which I have been doing and I have been showing you. In case you're wondering why the clips aren't in HD, it's because apparently the HD version sucks, the color grade is weird and sometimes the crew aren't cropped out of the sides of episodes. But another thing that I saw is that sometimes when people recommended episode guides to the show where people were saying watch these ones which are key, Angel was always an episode that is listed as a key one to watch in the first season, even if you skip all the rest of the first season. In this episode called Angel, we learn about Angel. Probably not much of a revelation there. The Master sends three fierce vampires after Buffy, and it seems like she's almost done for until, oh, 
Oh my god, here he comes, Jesus Christ, he's so hot. So Angel comes along and helps her kick their collective asses, though he's injured in the process. While I was watching, I definitely had a moment during this fight specifically where I thought, oh my god, Buffy and Angel would be a great Halloween costume. So if anyone wants to dress up as either of them, I can be the other one. Uh, or alternatively, I'm still taking applications for anyone to be the Paul Mescal to my Phoebe Bridgers costume from Halloween 2022. Buffy invites Angel into her house and helps patch him up before she sneaks him upstairs and he stays the night. He also reveals that he hates vampires because his family was killed by vampires. And then later, they kiss. But oh no, it turns out he's a vampire. And then he eats himself out the window. I do wish I had been able to see this moment at the time with no prior knowledge. There's a lot that I don't know about the series having never watched it, but there are some things that I did know going in and Angel being a vampire is just one that I took for granted as common knowledge. But I imagine it would have been a really cool reveal when up to this point Angel had just been like some mysterious stranger who showed up to help Buffy out and now suddenly he's a vampire. I do say this word differently to how they say it in the show, but Giles finds out that Angel used to go by the name Angelus, and that he came from Ireland, which is where I'm from, and where I am right now. This is it. This is all of Ireland. <laughs> I do know for a fact, I think, I think I know definitely for a fact 100% that maybe there is an episode later in the series where it shows him back in Ireland and he has a really bad Irish accent so I guess I'm looking forward to that. But like 60 years back or something he came to America and has lived a solitary life ever since and stopped preying on humans. Remember Budapest? Turn of the century? You were such a bad boy during that earthquake. This, this really stood out to me. I don't know what it is with Joss Whedon and Budapest, but he also had that basically same moment in the Avengers. Darla, who I haven't really mentioned much but who's been knocking about, tricks Buffy's mom into inviting her in, then bites her, tries to tempt Angel into biting her too, which he resists, and leaves to let Buffy find Angel in vampire form with Buffy's mom in his arms with a bitten neck. Not a great look. Buffy defenestrates him, so glad that I get to use that word, takes her mom to the hospital and then heads off to kill Angel. B but they were just kissing! I liked the part where they were kissing each other, not the part where they're trying to kill each other. Wrong letters. Should be S instead of L. Giles, Xander, and Willow learn from Joyce that it was actually Darla, not Angel, who attacked her, and run off to warn Buffy that she's walking into a trap. She tracks him to the bronze, because everything important has to happen here. The two of them fight a little, and then Angel reveals his tragic backstory, and this is where we also learn some of the world building for this show and how vampires have no souls. It turns out that Angel killed all of his own family and also a young girl whose family then cursed him. How did they curse him? Well, they gave him his soul back, so now he's 100% vampire, but he also has to live with the remorse of everything he did as a vampire too. Then Darla shows up and, well... What's more dangerous than a vampire? A vampire with a gun. And she's got two! Anyway, I started blasting. Bah, wow. bah. The rest of the gang distract Darla, and then Angel kills her. Whoops, maybe I should have mentioned her more. Later on, Buffy and Angel meet and kiss again before saying goodbye, deciding that they probably shouldn't get involved with each other. I love this moment at the end here where we see that Buffy's cross, which you might remember Angel gave her in the first episode, was burning Angel as they kissed, but he didn't even react, presumably because he didn't want Buffy to stop kissing him. I will admit that I have absolutely allowed myself get invested into Angel x Buffy. I don't know what their ship name is, I don't want to Google it, I don't want to Google anything about this show because I assume people don't really care about spoilers much anymore since, you know, it's from 1997. But I do really have to try not to to think about the fact that not only is he a grown-ass man and she's a 16-year-old child, he's a hundreds of years old immortal being. But they kissed again, so yay! <laughs> like I said, I'm trying not to think about it too much because otherwise I probably wouldn't enjoy the show. I'm just suspending my disbelief. And if I do buy into shipping them, then it just makes the viewing experience a bit more fun. Like, I just want to enjoy the campy high school vampire show. Episode 8. I, Robot, You, Jane. When I said that episode 5 was my second least favourite title of an episode in the season, 
this is my least favourite. It is the year of our Lord 1418 and we are in Italy. The demon Moloch is just minding his own business when some priests trap him inside of a book, inside of a box, that they hope will never be read. Flash forward to the Sunnydale High School Library in the mid to late 1990s. Because of course the demon book would end up there. What about the last seven episodes has made any of us think that it wouldn't end up in Sunnydale High School? I'm surprised it wasn't buried beneath the bronze. Willow scans the book and all of the text disappears. Then, the next week, she tells Buffy about a boy named Malcolm who she's been talking to on the internet. Yes, this is going exactly where you think it is, and I'm delighted that they went this hard into the demon in the internet thing. We meet the computer teacher, Miss Callender, as well as two nerds in the computer class, Fritz and Dave, and Fritz receives a spooky message on his monitor telling him to watch Buffy. Buffy, worried about who Malcolm could be, asks Dave about Willow, and Dave tells her to leave Willow alone. Meanwhile, Willow tries to ask Malcolm to meet, but gets suspicious when he starts sharing information about Buffy's past. Dave and Fritz set up a trap to kill Buffy by electrocution, but Dave warns her at the last second, a move which will get him killed by Fritz on Moloch's instruction. Giles, hating anything that uses an electric current, Hey, it's okay King, I still love you even if you're incredibly resistant to change. Enlist the help of Miss Callender to defeat Moloch while having the most textbook antagonistic flirting ever. At this stage, one episode later, I have forgotten about Buffy and Angel, I want these two to kiss. Also, it turns out that Miss Callender already knows all about the internet and demons because she is, wait for this, a techno-pagan, which is the coolest fucking word I have ever heard. And I was happily surprised to find out that this is a real term with a Wikipedia page in a hull, so if there are any techno-pagans watching right now, please tell me all about it in the comments. Fritz kidnaps Willow, bringing her to an old abandoned tech company that Moloch has made his base and where he has constructed himself a fucking cyborg body. This is an unrealistic body image for men. Moloch kills Fritz and declares his love for Willow, then fights Buffy who destroys his robot body. Meanwhile Giles and Jenny cast a spell to purge him from the internet. This episode slaps, start to finish, it's ridiculous, it's absolutely a time capsule from the 1990s, but I love it. Also, Xander was there, I guess? Episode 9, The Puppet Show. So I only had one note for this entire episode, and it's that I finally realised who Xander reminds me of. It's Matthew Perry as Chandler Bing. Once I realised that I have not been able to unsee it, it's honestly uncanny. It's talent show time at Sunnydale High School. We've got a ventriloquist, a magician, Cordelia singing, and a girl who is murdered and has her heart removed. But of course, the show is still going on because this school is terrifying. Willow and Xander investigate and are led to Morgan, the ventriloquist who has a puppet named Sid, who Buffy is convinced is self-aware. And she's right, he is. Sid gets confiscated by one of Morgan's teachers, and so Xander steals him, obviously, for whatever reason, then mocks Buffy's suspicion about the dummy before turning around and having Sid disappear on him. Buffy then finds Morgan, also murdered, with his brain removed, and yes, the talent show is still going to go ahead. <laughs> ahead. Get it? Like, like where Morgan's brain used to be. After fighting Sid the dummy and subduing him, Buffy learns that Sid is actually a demon slayer who was cursed to become a dummy, and he thought Buffy was the culprit of the murders. It's just kind of a wacky fun time where each of them thought that the other one was murdering people. But if it wasn't Sid, and it wasn't Buffy, then who was Phone? So Sid needs to kill the demon to break his curse, but it will also lead to his death. Buffy finds Morgan's brain, which it turns out wasn't viable for the demon who's collecting good, healthy human organs, meaning that the demon is still on the loose and looking for a brain. Totally unrelated, but meanwhile Giles is being strapped into a fake guillotine for the magician's talent show performance. It is a fake guillotine, right? <gasps> Oh no, his big beefy British brain! But anyway, Buffy, Xander and Willow free Giles, and then Sid cuts out the demon's heart, killing both of them. I don't get it. What is it? Avant-garde? I, I said big beefy British brain so many times. Big beefy British brain. Big beefy British brain. <laughs> Episode 10, Nightmares. 
Just a quick content warning before this episode for abuse involving children. If you think you'd like to skip this episode in the chapter markers or in the description, you can find the timestamp for episode 11, which is where you want to go. After a nightmare where she's being choked by the master, Buffy is woken by her mom, and she then remembers that she gets to spend this weekend with her dad who's visiting from LA. I'm not sure why, but at the mention of Buffy's dad here, I did get the feeling that like, oh, I bet he's gonna be involved in supernatural stuff. It's not resolved either way, it's not even brought up at all in this episode whether he is or isn't, but this is me planting a seed of a theory for future episodes. Here's a very quick arachnophobia warning, skip ahead 10 seconds. When she's in class that day, Buffy sees a young boy in the corridor outside. Just after this, a student named Wendell opens his textbook, only to have tarantulas crawl out of it and onto him, which he tells Xander and Willow he dreams of regularly. Now, maybe I'm an idiot, but I'm going to clarify something here that I did not realise until the start of the final episode, which is episode 12. So I went through all of this episode and episode 11 without knowing this. This kid is not the anointed one. I personally think it was a pretty bold choice on the creative team's part to have a second young child who's also involved in the plot in this season, but maybe I just can't tell the difference between kids, I don't know. We then see other students' nightmares coming true, including a girl named Laura who ends up in a hospital after being attacked by a demon when she tries to sneak down to the basement to smoke. Which, like, I mean, I don't condone teenagers smoking inside their school buildings, but this seems like a pretty harsh punishment, to be honest. Buffy and Giles visit the hospital, where Buffy sees Billy, the boy from earlier, in a coma in a hospital bed. Buffy's dad shows up to collect her from school, and when they walk to the park, he tells her that she was responsible for her parents' divorce, and that he doesn't want to hang out with her at the weekend anymore. Buffy talks to Billy, who is still in a coma, and then both of them are attacked by the demon who attacked Laura earlier. They flee to the graveyard, but run into the master, who is seemingly able to physically hurt Buffy because of a breakdown of the barrier between dreams and reality. He throws Buffy into a coffin and buries her. Xander, Willow, and Giles help her escape the grave, but Buffy is a vampire now! Giles suggests that waking Billy could end the nightmares, but Billy doesn't want to wake up as he's scared of the demon, so Buffy beats the shit out of the demon to prove that it's not a threat. Billy wakes, restoring reality, and then his little league baseball coach comes in asking if he's okay. The gang realise that he was the one who Billy had based the nightmare demon on because he was the one who put Billy in hospital after they lost a game. I do think that I can see what they were going for here, but I don't think it was the most sensitive way to deal with physical abuse, especially because the solution ended up being to beat up the dream version of the abuser and then tell him off in real life. Maybe I'm hoping too much for a nuanced take on abuse in a 40 minute episode of a TV show that came out in 1997, but I was disappointed with it a little bit. Episode 11, Out of Mind, Out of Sight. A boy at the start of this episode gets beaten up by a seemingly floating baseball bat after hearing a girl laughing. Later, we have an incident where a girl falls down the stairs but claims that she was pushed, and both of these incidents happen to people who are close to Cordelia. And actually, let me talk about her for a bit. Like I said, I'm very hesitant to Google anything about this show to avoid spoilers, but because of that, I have no idea what the fan consensus is on different characters, including Cordelia, but she might unironically be my absolute favourite character. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure if it's a hot take or not because I don't know what people think of her, but I hope that it's not a hot take. I hope that a lot of people really like Cordelia because I think that she's great and she deserves to be a beloved character. What I really like so far is that she's not just the total caricature of the most popular girl in school, but she's also not like the total subversion of the bully trope where actually she has a tragic backstory that made her this way. Like, don't get me wrong, she can absolutely be mean in the way that she talks to people and she's often quite shallow but it all strikes me as very honest like she's just unapologetically herself and says what she wants and I kind of love her for it. I'm really excited for her to become a bigger character which I think she does even in the first episode like just the way she's introduced made me think oh this girl is going to end up like a begrudging friend to the main cast. I mean, it, I feel like it's kind of telegraphed. My kind of vapid queen for life 
Cordelia. Okay, that's enough about the objective best character in the show. Let's go back to the Invisible Girl episode. That's right, the person behind these mysterious goings on is a flautist who attended the school named Marcy, who disappeared a few months ago when she became invisible, which Giles suggests could be a result of simply being ignored by everyone in the school. Also, Angel. Oh. God, look at him. Angel shows up at one stage and they do the vampire reflection thing, which I always love seeing, and he tells Giles that he can find a book that would help Giles learn more about the Master, keeping that overarching season plotline alive. Also, I know that I was just gushing about Cordelia, who is, in my opinion, played by a very attractive actor, who was 26 when she made this show, just to clarify, which is the age that I am now. But I also made a short and sweet note during this episode that I will read verbatim. God, Angel is so attractive. Jesus fucking Christ. Really, I just like that this show has plenty of actors for the casual bisexual viewer. I do think that the cast are quite good looking in general. I mean, look at those glasses. So Cordelia asks Buffy for help, saying that she also feels lonely sometimes, but not in a like, woe is me way, because she's fucking Cordelia, man. She's the best character, and she's just telling it like it is. I think Gaslight Gatekeep Girl Boss came too late for Cordelia, but it would have fit her, I think, perfectly. <laughs> Actually, no, she's too honest to Gaslight. She will just tell, yeah, she just tells everything like it is. Never mind. Marcy traps Xander, Willow, and Giles in the school's boiler room as it fills with gas. But don't worry, they're rescued by Angel, who also gives Giles the book that he was looking for. God, he can read too? Is there anything this guy can't do? Then Marcy kidnaps Buffy and Cordelia and takes them to... Wait, why? Why is it the bronze again? What is it about this cl Like, how has it not been shut down yet? Look, I'll give it to them, they probably had, like, very limited budget and limited sets to work with, so. Anyway, Marcy's plan is to disfigure Cordelia's face, which is pretty fucked. Girl needs some therapy. I hope she gets some after this. Marcy does manage to cut Cordelia's face before Buffy escapes and subdues her with a curtain. And then some men in black arrive and take Marcy away, and they explain that this has happened in schools all around the country, so they're gonna take her somewhere where she can be rehabilitated to reintegrate into society. Uh, like therapy, right? Right? Nope. She's being trained to become an assassin. As of where I currently am in the show, which is just over halfway through season two, this has not come back up again, but I have a feeling that invisible FBI assassins will come up again. We'll see. It's the FBI in the show, but this really feels more like a CIA kind of thing. Bastards. Episode 12, and the final episode of season one, Prophecy Girl. Giles discovers a prophecy in the book that Angel gave him last episode, which says that the Slayer shall die while fighting the Master. Huh. Who's the Slayer again? Oh shit, no! An earthquake hits Sunnydale and splits open the floor of the library, and Jenny also talks about seeing apocalyptic portents, so it seems like the prophecy is close to happening. Meanwhile, Xander asks Buffy to prom, is rejected, and does not help my already mixed to low opinion of him with his reaction to it. Forget it. I'm not him. I mean, I guess the guy's gotta be undead to make time with you. That's really harsh. He then says to Willow that he and she can go together, but she also says no. I haven't really talked about it so far, but every couple of episodes we do get reminded that Xander likes Buffy and Willow likes Xander. I will say, and it's I'm probably a bit biased because I don't really like Xander and I relate a lot with Willow, but I am very excited for Willow to get the fuck over Xander because I don't think the show really does a good job of even giving us a reason for why she likes him that much. I guess they haven't really done much to show us why Xander likes Buffy either. Both instances are just like because they do. And I guess you know, like, sometimes crushes just happen, but this is TV. They don't need to just happen. Give me a reason or move the fuck on. Buffy overhears Angel and an emotional Giles talking about the prophecy and the fact that she's going to die tomorrow night. This scene is probably my favourite of the show so far. We get an emotional exchange of Buffy first being upset that Giles hadn't told her and then being upset at the prophecy, which she decides to reject. She says that she's quitting being the Slayer and she also throws the cross that Angel gave her to the ground. What I really loved about this scene, enough to make a note specifically while watching, was the choice to have no music 
music under it. There's no sad sounds underneath the scene telling you how you should be feeling as if you don't know. They trust the viewer to understand the significance of the scene and they let the performances speak for themselves, which I think the performances absolutely do with Sarah Michelle Gellar killing it here. After that, Buffy heads home and tries to convince her mother to leave Sunnydale for the weekend, but her mother instead talks about how she met Buffy's father at her own prom and then gives Buffy a white dress to wear to the prom. The next day, Willow and Cordelia come across boys in the AV club room who have been slaughtered by vampires. Okay, so here's part of why I have so much sympathy for Cordelia because she's often at like the center of whatever hardship or peril is being caused by like the villain of the week. And in this episode, she finds the violently murdered corpse of her boyfriend. Like, I will not hear any further slander against her. She is going through it. Buffy visits Willow that evening and our nerdy queen shows something that I feel has been lacking up to this point in this show, a genuine traumatic response to what must have been an incredibly traumatic event. I do get that a show about vampires in a high school isn't going to have real life reactions to these kind of events like when the talent show or prom go ahead when there have been students murdered on school grounds that day, but I do appreciate this moment where they actually do add a bit of realism and it really helps with the moment, I think. Willow is not okay after what she witnessed, and girl, I wouldn't be either. Buffy decides to do her duty as the Slayer and returns to Giles, who's in the middle of telling Jenny that he'll face the Master instead of Buffy. Side note, just for the record, I do still want these two to smooch. When he insists that he won't let her go, Buffy punches him in the face and knocks him out cold, which I really don't think he deserved. Then Buffy is led to the Master's Lair by the Anointed One, who Wikipedia says is named... Colin. Don't want to mock a child's name, but um, they couldn't have given him like a cool vampire name. I guess the anointed one is his vampire name. I do love that Buffy's going through with fighting the master in this dress. It really hammers home the like high schooler slayer dual life thing. Maybe even a bit too much, but look, I'm having fun, so. Xander convinces Angel to take him to the Master's lair to help Buffy. I don't exactly know how he thought he would help fight the Master, but whatever. And the two of them head off. The Master and Buffy talk a little in the lair, and I have to say that the Joss Whedonisms haven't been too egregious when it's been high school students saying them, but I buy it a lot less when a big, bad, ancient vampire is making quips. Oh, good. The feeble banter portion of the fight. Why don't we just cut to the... Nice shot. The Master reveals that the key to his release is actually the Slayer's blood, and so he drinks from her and leaves her to drown. By the way, I like your dress. And... Let me tell you, the master being freed leads to one of the most unintentionally funny moments of the show so far. The master, a probably thousands years old vampire waking up after however long to a random town in California like, Ah, my world. Ooh, in and out did they put a mini mall over our old satanic worshipping ground? I don't know why I'm using this voice, he has an American accent in, in the show. Willow and Jenny theorise that the Hellmouth is located beneath the bronze, of course it is, but before they can try and warn the students at the club about the danger, they're trapped by vampires. But then Cordelia rescues them in her car and, oh, oh wait, no, Cordelia, you can't drive it, oh fuck, what's she doing? Oh, never mind, they're fine. Okay, queen shit. Xander and Angel find Buffy drowning, and Xander resuscitates her with CPR. Okay, I'll give him this one, he, he did something. Now Giles, Jenny, Willow, and Cordelia are fighting off vampires in the library, until it's revealed that the Hellmouth is actually right beneath the library. I bet Giles is like secretly jazzed about this afterwards because the man is horny for books and the Hellmouth. Buffy's on the roof now with the Master who she starts to fight and it seems like she's a little stronger than before. I'm not sure if maybe this is a hint that she like she's like a Dampier now or something. I'm actually not Dampier. I think that's how you say that word. It's like a half vampire, half human person. Buffy finally gets the upper hand on the Master and tosses him down into the library where he becomes impaled on some wooden furniture, turning to dust and leaving only his skeleton. Even though all the other vampires in the show totally disappeared when staked, skeleton and all. Look, I guess it makes sense, he's like the BBEG vampire. And then everyone goes to hit up the prom at the bronze. I also noticed as I was watching that they use a piano version of the main theme under this scene, which I like, I think it's a nice touch. The last shot of the season lingers on the master's skeleton, which I personally thought was very goofy, but hey, I'm having fun.
And that's season one of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I had a lot of fun watching this and um, like I said I was resistant originally the first couple dozen times that I heard people talking about how good it was but I did enjoy. I do know as well that this season is considered like kind of a bit rough I think. Spoilers I am already watching season two and I'm enjoying it even more but I did really enjoy it. There are a few things that I liked like for example the choice not to have Buffy go through the what I'm a slayer and learning who she is like we just come in she knows it she knows what's up and we get to see the kind of like whoa what vampires are real through like the other characters eyes I don't think we need to have Buffy learning everything and she still does learn some stuff from Giles and we all learn stuff from like what this is like an apocalyptic event and it's the first time it's happened in 20 years and we're gonna have like 50 of them in the show or whatever like there is that kind of learning as you go you do learn some things with the characters but I like that Buffy comes into it competent and confident she She's spunky and I like her. I also realized in the middle of doing this that I kind of talked a little bit about Willow and a little bit about Xander and a little bit about Cordelia but I haven't talked too much about Buffy's character. I don't think she made quite as much of an impression honestly. I did like her but I'm looking forward to giving more like in-depth thoughts on her as the seasons go on. Season 2 is also a lot longer and just based on my recording so far I do think that this video is going to be quite long uh, at least compared to what I originally thought. We'll see how it comes out in the edit. So if indeed I do continue on and do a video for season two as well with double the episodes, I will probably have to go into less detail or skip episodes or else just make an incredibly long video. I don't know. Also, if you don't want me to do season two, please let me know. In fact, if you hated this video, make sure to tell me all the things you hated about it in the comments because that's engagement, baby. <laughs> but that's it. Uh, thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I will hopefully see you in a different video, or in season 2 Buffy video. Goodbye. <laughs>